science of medicine. Today I want to talk about the nervous system and I'm going to do this in many parts because there are a lot of complexities associated with this and I want to make sure that you have a functional overview of how your nervous system works. So to begin with, the nervous system is a control system. Its purpose is a hardwired type of control of many of the functions that you exhibit. Uh, that could be coordination of your body in terms of moving your hand or something like that, sensory, language, sight. And it's composed of two general pieces. The central nervous system, which is comprised of your brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which has three pieces. The sensory portion, where your sensors from various parts in your body will actually take information back to the central nervous system. The motor or the muscle part, where instructions from your brain will transmit through your spinal cord and out to muscles. And then the system, which we've referred to several times across uh, this Science of Medicine lecture series, called the autonomic or automatic nervous system. And this has two parts. The sympathetic nervous system, which is kind of your fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and relaxation. And there are many different tasks to each of these that we'll talk about. Now, the basic functional unit of the nervous system is the neuron. And neurons come in lots of different types. I'm gonna talk about a typical type of uh, neuron, and it's going to have a body, and that body will be composed of a nucleus, which sometimes is called gray matter, as well as dendrites, which will receive information and axons, which will transmit outgoing information to other places, either other neurons or to other affected uh, places such as muscles. Now, the axon will also have with it an associated glial cell or support cell. And these cells will have projections that will envelop portions of the axon that will then cause them to be called white matter. So it's in the central nervous system called an oligodendrocyte. And these glial cells in the peripheral system, nerve system is, are called Schwann cells, but they serve the same purpose. Now, most neurons in the central nervous system are connections between one neuron and another. They're called interneurons. And then the peripheral nervous system, as I alluded to, you're gonna have neurons that will take information from various sensors back to the spinal cord, cord, those are called sensory neurons, and those that will take information out to the uh, motor uh, so that it will be contract this muscle, and those are motor neurons. To remind you, neurons are excitable cells. They'll have a certain resting membrane potential, which would be given by, let's say, the Goldman equation. And the potential difference across that membrane will be on the order of tens of millivolts. And that tens of millivolts doesn't imply a very large difference of charge separation, but that charge separation is over a very small distance. Now, when there is an appropriate signal that lies above th some threshold, an action potential will result. And that action potential will have different parts to it. If you remember when we were talking about cardiac, uh, that you would have an initial depolarization where sodium channels would open up and sodium would rush from the higher extracellular regime to the intracellular regime. And then during that depolarization, there would be voltage-gated potassium channels that would open up such that potassium would rush from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell and then the sodium channels would also close up. So as that happens, you'll get a peak and a repolarization will occur. This will tend to overshoot the threshold resting membrane potential that will then be restored based upon uh, sodium potassium ATPase channels. 
And that will lead to a refractory period during which I won't be able to depolarize the neuron again. Now, if I look at nervous system neurons, some of those can be quite long. For example, the motor neurons that would go from the lower portion of your spinal cord down to muscles that would be in your leg might be many feet long. And so consequently, those axons are very, very long. And if I had to have signal propagation via depolarization, repolarization from one portion of the membrane to the next adjacent portion, it would lead to a very slow signal propagation. And so while that does occur, especially up towards the, uh, of the, uh, the body of the neuron, up at the axon hillock, in fact, most of the propagation in many nerves is along this myelinated axon because that's where most of the distance is. And so remember that I have these glial cells, peripheral nervous system, now Schwann cells, oligodendrocytes in the uh, central nervous system. And these glial cells will wrap around the axon body and create this fatty insulating layer, this sheath of what we call myelin. And so nerves that have this are called myelinated nerves. And along the axon, there will be small gaps, which are called nodes of Rendier. And those small gaps will not be myelinated. Now, when I transmit signals, I will have a different signal conduction along these myelinated axons that will allow for much faster passage. Because when I open up channels, in these nodes, they will allow for an electric field to emanate forth that will then provide for what we call saltatory conduction. And without getting into fairly complex mathematics, you can think about this as the electrical field allowing for the transmission or hopping of that signal from one node to another. And we refer to that as saltatory conduction. This allows for transmission of signals along myelinated neurons to be much faster than what it would be if they just had to depolarize an adjacent portion of a membrane as it progressed through that axon. Now, when you get to the end of a neuron, you have to use a different mode of transmission. And at that axon terminal, that mode is via a neurotransmitter. Now, the neurotransmitter diffuses across a synapse. It could be with the dendrite of another nerve, or it could be with an end organ or a muscle, something like that. And that neurotransmitter will diffuse across that synapse and then allow this electrical signal to progress, normally by opening of sodium channels, as in the neuromuscular junction. Uh, but that process then will allow, if it's one neuron going to another, as a transmission. And so as you have a neuromuscular junction where you have the nerve interfacing with skeletal muscle as shown here in uh, this micrograph, you can see the skeletal muscle has these small interfaces, which are these dark purplish black circles where the neurons are coming down and terminating there. And as you remember, that neuromuscular junction will have that small synapse where acetylcholine will diffuse across and then will open up sodium channels and permit the depolarization of the skeletal muscle so that it can contract. Another thing that neurons do quite well is to integrate information. And the picture that is here is of Purkinje neurons and these are found in the cerebellum. And you can see that there are many, 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 many dendrites, but there's really an output which is very limited. And much like electrical circuits can take lots of information and then give a single output, so it is with the cerebellum and with these Purkinje neurons that they will be able to integrate a lot of information and then be able to put out above a threshold. 
So I hope that this has given you an overview of the basic functional units that we'll actually now build upon as we talk about the central and peripheral nervous system so that you can actually understand how you actually work in terms of the nervous system. As always, you're welcome to make comments. You can subscribe or like this, and I will see you back soon for the next session.